Welcome to the Performance Enhancing Podcast. It's like steroids for your brain. A podcast for people that want the best info, but just don't have the time. Get your podcast fix with the Cliff Notes versions of your favorite podcasts. No fluff, just the actionable golden nuggets. Having this much knowledge at your fingertips should be downright illegal. So get ready for another dose of Performance Enhancing Podcast with Satori Prime. Here's your host, Elon Ferdman. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to another Performance Enhancing Podcast with myself, Elon Ferdman. I am thrilled in what I'm about to share with you today. You're about to listen to an interview I just did with Stephen Cutler, the author of Rise of Superman. Now, before we jump right into the actual meat and potatoes of the interview, I wanted to actually read you, if you'll give me about 10 minutes, an excerpt from this book, specifically about a free climber called Dean Potter, because Stephen and I jumped right into a part of the story. So rather than kind of have him tell it, I thought it'd be great if I just read you this excerpt. That way you actually get a sense of the book. And then when he and I actually jump right into this particular instance, you'll have a background of reference. So with that said, let me read you chapter three, The Wear of Flow and a little bit about Dean Potter. Mount Fitzroy, the tallest mountain in Patagonia, is a daunting blade of rock, jagged and ragged and mean. On the list of the world's most dangerous climbs, Fitzroy always ranks in the top 20, often in the top 10. It is cold, it is isolated, and getting to its zenith demands crossing a vertical ocean of granite protected by some of the most ferocious weather on Earth. In the early 2000s, a climber by the name of Dean Potter thought he'd solved that puzzle. Patagonia's weather is terrible. If you get a break, it's only going to last a day or two. That's not a lot of time for a traditional mountaineer's approach, i.e. multiple people on the team, ropes, protection. But I had been developing a style of rapid, big wall, free soloing. For example, alone, no ropes, no protection, that I thought might work well on the more traditional routes. Free soloing is the mother of all death sports. The equation is simple. You fall, you die. It is also, at least for a certain breed of athlete, deeply pure and undeniably enticing. Without ropes or gear in the way, there is only the climber and the rock, as intimate and personal a relationship as can be had with big nature. Up on the High Lonesome, explains author John Long in his appropriately titled book, The High Lonesome, The soloist answered to his own standards, the climbing at hand, and God in that order. Many have answered to God. Over the past few decades, the desire for this relationship has claimed a bevy of our best climbers, the majority of them dying on shorter, smaller routes. Very few people have played this game in the bigger mountains. That Potter wanted to test out his style of rapid big wall free soloing in Patagonia on a beast like Fitzroy? Well, let's just say he had his reasons. To understand those reasons, we need to understand more about the man. Potter was born in Kansas in 1972, the son of an army colonel and a yoga teacher. Before he was four years old, Potter was copying his mom's moves, adding breath and stretch, and twisting himself up like a pretzel. I think yoga gave me a first taste of the zone, he recounts, but I definitely got a runner's high, now considered a low-grade flow state, out training with my dad and the troops. The high stayed with Potter, shaped him, began to define him. I noticed there was a pattern to it, he says. I'd be running, and it'd be hard, and then I'd check out for a little while. I saw early on that being exhausted made it easier to quiet the mind and get to the zone. His most poignant lesson occurred the first time his father took him fishing. Getting to their desired spot meant stepping across a series of slime-covered rocks. Dean was nervous, lost his footing, and plunged into the river. The cold knocked the wind from him. He scrambled up the bank and started crying, I don't like fishing, he bawled. I want to go home. Potter's father shook his head no. Instead, he gave his son some advice. Put everything aside. There's nothing to be afraid except a little cold water. Just focus on the next steps you're trying to take. Focus was the key to getting past the fear, and everything else as well. Pretty soon, Bean was skipping from stone to stone, his body automatically going where it needed to go. By day's end, he was racing around the river, playing in rapids, all of his senses remarkably heightened. That gave me a lot of confidence, he says now, but it also gave me a glimpse of the superpowers and my first memory of the voice. The voice. The voice of intuition, the center of the zone's mystery. Everybody who has ever been in a flow state has heard it. A voice very different from the mind's normal chatter. 
Neuroscientist David Eagleman likes to quote Pink Floyd when describing this facet. There's someone in my head, but it's not me. While the Indian philosopher Jiddu Krishnamurti refers to this someone as the tyrant, certainly both statements track with Potter's experience. Right before I have to make a move, the voice tells me what to do, and it's never wrong. When the voice tells you to do something, you do it. Right then, don't think, no questions asked. Not listening to the voice is what will get you killed. I learned that really early in my climbing career. So what is the voice? Carl Jung defined intuition as perception via the unconscious. And the voice is the end result of that perception. The unconscious mind broadcasting its perceptions to the conscious mind. Of course, it's not always a voice. Some people see images. Others get strong feelings. Occasionally, the information arrives by multiple channels, and that information arrives constantly. Intuition is a permanent feature of standard brain function, meaning the voice is always communicating with us, yet we can rarely hear it. The data is diluted and distorted by everything else the mind is considering. But in flow, for reasons we'll explore in this chapter, the signal is stronger, the message clearer, and for those on the receiving end, the feeling accompanying the broadcast is often one of profound relief, a sense that finally, at long last, someone else is driving this bus. Potter has been listening to the voice over a career that's had few parallels. As a climber, his reputation hinges on speed and daring. In 1998, he ran up Yosemite's legendary Half Dome in 4 hours and 16 minutes. The previous record was 20 hours and 56 minutes. In 1999, it was the Half Dome and the Nose on El Capitan in 23 hours, marking the first solo one-day assault of both routes. In 2000, Potter went alone and ropeless up Blind Faith, the Rustrum, and Astroman, three notable terrors that would surely kill most mortals. The following year, he broke the four-hour mark on the nose, three hours, 59 minutes, 35 seconds, which would be a lifetime achievement for most, and for him, was just the beginning. In 2002, with these warm-ups behind him, Potter took his one-man band down to Patagonia. Within a few days of arrival, he became the first person of free solo Mount Fitzroy, sending Super Canaletta, a classic mile-long ice and rock route, in an astounding six and a half hours. Next. After little rest and a 24-hour hike, including a pitch-black glacier crossing, he tackled the solo compressor route up Cerro Torre, a nearby mountain that ranks just below Fitzroy on the climber's list of terrible tyrants. Potter didn't seem to mind. He topped out in record-breaking 11 hours, then happened to glance across the valley and back at Fitzroy. The most famous route up Fitzroy is known as Californian. Directly below it sits the deadly Poinsina Kulwa. Linking the two together has been a long-time dream of climbers, but a giant serac overhanging the Kua makes the danger extreme. Over the years, an uncomfortable number of athletes have lost their lives trying to join these routes. Making matters more complicated, the Kua and the Californian are connected by a featureless stretch of stone over 250 feet high. Only when a rare ice flow, a frozen waterfall, forms can the section be crossed. While Potter is admittedly not much of an ice climber, when he glanced across that valley and saw the ice flow in place, well, what other choice did he have? I was following the voice, he recounts, and more focused than I'd ever been. I was doing everything I could to cultivate that heightened awareness. I was down there alone, sleeping under rocks, not talking to anyone, meditating, all to help strengthen my intuition. The voice said climb, so that's what I did. When Potter started up the route, he didn't need his intuition to alert him to danger. Above him, the serac was moaning. It was 100,000-year-old blue ice, and it was wailing, like listening to a ticking time bomb. My body had an instinctive reaction to the sound. I started climbing like a maniac. I couldn't have slowed down even if I tried. Potter zipped up the cool wah and then sailed over the ice flow. It was the hardest ice climbing he'd ever done but nothing could slow him down. He reached the halfway point on the route in less than five hours, shaving a day and a half off the traditional pace, but the frenzy had come at a cost. Potter's heart, already racing, started skipping beats. Certain he was about to have a heart attack, he ate all his food, trying to give his body the fuel to calm down. It was a big bet. Still to come was the last big push of the route, a 2,000-foot vertical rock wall. It was huge, recounts Potter, and I had no idea which was the right way to go. But I started following the footholds, listening to the voice, and not questioning. 
This was no easy task. The wall Potter faced was over one third of a mile high, or roughly double the height of New York's Chrysler building. He had very little information about the correct way up, and it was biophysically impossible for him to judge the quality of the footholds from that far below. If we assume a three foot height gain per move, getting to Fitzroy's apex meant the voice would have to make 670 correct decisions in a row, and Potter could question none of them. Some of those decisions were fairly unusual. Near the top of that final push, at a point where the traditional route hugged a corner, Potter saw a crack on the face that seemed to be calling to him, really beckoning. But crack climbing without a rope is often an all or nothing proposition. Once Potter committed to that line, down climbing was not a possibility. The only way to survive was to finish the ascent. But there's no way to judge the depth of the crack, the quality of the rock, or any number of other unfathomable from below. If Potter's gut was the slightest bit wrong, there'd be no retreat. He'd never make it off the mountain alive. Yet again, his intuition was correct. The crack was perfect. Whatever I needed to jam in there, my hand, my feet, my knee, like key slipping into a lock, like the crack had been custom designed for my body. The crack ended in the rarest of gifts. Potter topped out into a giant crystal garden. He'd never seen anything like it, shimmering fractals of light all along the wall's face. Arguably, he was the first person in history to lay eyes on this place. Definitely, he was the first person in history to free solo three of Patagonia's biggest routes in a single season. But his ordeal wasn't quite over. Coming down off Fitzroy was supposed to be easier. Potter had decided to descend the friendlier east face. The route wasn't the issue. The issue was above that route, where a tremendous snowfield sat, jam-packed with loose rock. With nothing beyond a 5mm rope and 30 rappels ahead of him, Potter was concerned. A little sunshine, a little snowmelt, a little rockfall, it wouldn't take much to cut that rope in half. Four pitches into the descent, all the listening to his intuition paid off. Potter's ears started ringing. He looked up, he just knew. A few seconds later, there was deep, booming crack, and rock started to fall. Slabs the size of dining room tables were pulling free and tumbling down. A good-sized chunk was heading straight for his head. In this situation, standard protocol is to get small. Climbers try to flatten themselves against the wall, but the voice had yet to be wrong. Potter was told to kick outward, and again, he did as he was told, saving his own life in the process. By kicking outward, Potter got his head out of the projectile's flight path. Unfortunately, he exposed his torso. The rock clipped his thigh. The pain knocked him unconscious. He came to dangling 4,000 feet in the air, the appendage completely numb. It took 20 repels to get back to solid ground. Potter could use his leg for none of them. Unable to walk, Potter still faced a long hike and a dangerous glacier crossing. He slithered across the ice, traversing tiny snow bridges over giant crevasses on his belly. It took him 24 hours to reach his base camp. He literally crawled off the mountain. He was deeply satisfied. I went to Patagonia to cultivate my intuition, to listen to the voice. When I'm really in tune with it, really deep in the zone, I get to a place where I disappear completely, where I merge with the rock. When time slows down, my senses are unbelievably heightened, and I feel that oneness, that full body, psychic connection to the universe. It took risking my life to get there, but mission accomplished. And that's why I climb. I crave these experiences. I certainly don't climb to get to the top of rocks. So that's just one of the most amazing stories out of the rise of Superman and Dean Potter. And now let's jump into the rare mind of Stephen Cutler and get a glimpse as to what the owner of the Flow Genome Project will tell us further about Dean Potter and Flow. Enjoy this podcast, everyone. Hi, everyone. Elon here. Welcome to another installment of Performance Enhancing Podcast. Uh, to say I'm excited today would be a tremendous understatement. I'm actually here with Stephen Cutler, and for those of you that have been listening, you've obviously heard me share a lot about him in other podcasts, but for those that don't, I'll just do a quick intro so you guys know who we actually have the privilege of uh, speaking with today. So Stephen Cutler is a New York Times bestselling author. He's also an award-winning journalist, and 
Most notably, I think the co-founder and director of research for the Flow Genome Project, which we'll talk about today. And then you guys may have read his other book called Abundance. He also had West of Jesus. And uh, a book that I thought was very curious, A Small Furry Prayer, which was inspired by the sanctuary that you've built, right, Stephen? Yep. In, uh, in 2007 with his wife, which is a sanctuary for called Rancho de Chihuahua, and it's a hospice care and long-term rehabilitation for special needs dogs, which is really, really cool. And then finally, I guess what brought us here today is his most recent work, which is the one we'll be focusing on, a book called The Rise of Superman, which I've probably been shouting for the rooftops for some time, so I'm sure if you've been listening to us, you, you've probably already picked it up, but... Uh, just to have Stephen here with us and answering some of the questions that I thought were so unclear for me. Uh, so, Stephen, welcome. It's an absolute honor to have you here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, awesome, awesome. You're you're out skiing right now, right? Well, I live in New Mexico, and uh, it was uh, it was closing weekend. All it's all national forest land, so this was the last weekend to ski. So mm-hmm. I I would I was spent a day at Taos and spent a day at the Santa Fe ski area. Getting into flow, we hope. <laughs> Somewhat, yeah. <laughs> awesome. So, Stephen, um, I like you know I've, I've said to you before. I've, I've heard a lot of your podcasts and interviews, and to do something a little bit different, which I hope you'll be okay with is I wrote down kind of a few of the stories that I thought were incredible and the things that were still kind of left open and this for me, and uh, I'm hoping just to be able to kind of pick your brain on this because you're the, the master of this. Jump in. Let's get going. Awesome. Sweet. Okay, cool. So there's a story that you share about Dean after his old climbing adventure that uh, he decides to start base jumping into the Cave of Swallows. And then what ensues was probably one of the most, um, I would say, the spiritual side of flow, if you will. And um, I would just love to kind of start at that as our start point. Absolutely. So it's, a, it's, an, it's an astounding, astounding story. So Dean Potter, I believe he was on assignment with National Geographic, and he had become a base jumper. And uh, to kind of augment his climbing, he wanted to be able to climb up these amazing climbs and then instead of having to climb down, and he wanted to be able to jump off cliffs and just literally fly to the ground. And he got the opportunity to go down to Mexico and base jump into the cellar of Swallows, which is like a 2,000-foot open-air pit. And they had been there for a couple of days. They were going to do some high-lining, tight roping, walking across the cave, and they couldn't do that because it was too wet, too rainy. And so they did a whole bunch of, of base jumping. And at the very end of it, after they were everybody else was wrapping up, Dean decided he was going to do one last jump. He had to do one last jump, and he was really tired. He hadn't been feeling good all day, and he shouldn't have done it, and he knew he shouldn't have done it. His intuition was telling him otherwise. He didn't listen to any of the signs, and he's usually very good about you know paying attention to those kinds of things, and didn't notice that his parachute was wet. So he jumped into the cave of swallows, and you know the way he tells the story, he you know jumped and was immediately thrust into a very deep flow state. So time dilated, and slowed down. You got that freeze frame effect, like you're in a car crash for him. His senses were incredibly heightened. He could see everything on the wall. And you know, three seconds into his jump, he went to throw his parachute, and half the chute was wet. So the part that was wet collapsed. The part that was you know open or, or dry still opened, and he started spinning, and was literally like. 500 feet from the ground, and for half a second, the parachute caught, and, you know, he grabbed hold of the toggles, and instead of kind of pulling both down together, which is what he should have done in that situation, which would have moved him backwards, he ended up pulling one of his toggles and spun him directly into the rock wall, and he kind of basically flew into the wall, and at that moment, the parachute collapsed. It fell over his eyes, and in the split second before it fell over his eyes, they had been shooting this whole thing. They had photographers with them, so they hung a bright orange climbing rope 400 feet and started 400 feet from the ground. He saw this glimpse of orange, and he reached out and he tried to grab hold of the rope as he was falling at terminal velocity to his death. And ended up, mind you, his, the chute is totally over his eyes. He's clamping down as hard as he can. Of course, he's flying all the skin off his hands. He's bringing a lot. He can't hold on. He lets go. He knows he, you know, has to 
grab it again. He grabs hold again, and this time hangs on, and he stops himself. And he doesn't know where he is because the chute is over his eyes. And he hears his friend screaming down from above, let go, let go. And he lets go. He's, he was six, he stopped himself six feet from the ground and, you know, saved his own life while falling into the cellar, cellar of swallows. And it only happened because he was deep in flow and his perception time was so slowed down. He could navigate the entire situation, make all those countless decisions and, and save his own life. So that's the story. That is insane. Now, there's something that happens. Once it's okay, so for those that don't get it, like he's flying at what thermal velocity is what 120 miles an hour? It's up there a little, I think, a little higher. Yeah, 32. So this guy blindfolded ends up in a split second as he's falling to you know to his death at 120 miles an hour, reaches out and grabs a nylon rope and slows himself down enough to where he was like six feet above the ground. Yeah. Then the part that comes out, so this is the part that I'm literally in my car listening to this thing and I'm gasping. Cause I'm, I'm like, this guy's about to die and we're gonna find out in this slow motion. And then he lands and he hits the ground. And we could talk about, you know, what happens in his brain and why that all happens, but the part that comes next, where he finally lets go and he's on the ground. So it's a crazy, it's a crazy, so the seller of swallows is actually mis, uh, uh, Cave of Swallows is actually misnamed. The birds are actually Swifts, but like 10,000 Swifts make their home in this cave, right? So as he drops to the ground, and you have to understand he's totally wrecked. He has, in stopping himself on this rope, he has pulled all the muscles from his stomach through his ass and like literally blew out his rectus muscles, which he didn't even know was possible. And his hands are literally flayed almost to the bone. So he's in massive amounts of pain or should be, but he drops to the floor and he gets the chute off his head and the first thing he sees is a swift with a broken wing on the floor next to him. And he picks up the bird, right? The first thing he does, he just instantly in his like, ruined hands, he tries to like pick up the bird and the, he's so connected with the bird because he's just, you know, come through this life-threatening situation. We'll talk about why, I guess. Um, but he immediately, as soon as he picks up the bird, he becomes one with the bird. He experiences, you know, as he describes it, bird consciousness, this oneness with everything that is kind of at the heart of almost every one of our mystical experiences. And it also shows up in deep flow states. You hear this, you hear from surfers, they felt one with the wave, or climbers feel one with the mountain. Dean felt one with the, with the bird at that particular moment in time. Um, and so that's the, that was the end of that story. Yeah, and he, he actually said, and I'm sure, you, you've, I'm sure you've had these conversations with him because I'm sure it's like a point of interest to you, but he was saying that uh, when the bird eventually died, he literally died. And not like in some like weird meditative Buddhist type of way, but like he actually experienced death through the death of this bird. Is that right? Well, for me to explain that, we kind of got to talk about why this happens, what's going on okay. in the brain, so, yeah. where the yeah, experience I agree. Um, otherwise, that, uh, otherwise, none of it is going to make sense. Perfect. Let's so, go. And let's start with the very first kind of weirdness, right, we talked about, which is time slowing down, right? So what... Flow is caused by really complicated neurobiological reactions in the brain. One of the things that happens in the brain is known as transient hypofrontality. Transient means temporary. Hypo, hypo, H-Y-P-O is the opposite of hyper. means to slow down or deactivate. Frontality refers to the prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain that's right behind our forehead that houses all of our higher cognitive functions, right? So why does time pass so strangely in flow? As, as you pointed out, you, sometimes it's, it slows down, sometimes it speeds up. So you'll get it, the technical term for this is time dilation. Sometimes you get that freeze frame effect like in a car crash. Sometimes five hours will pass by in five minutes, right? It goes either way. But the reason that happens is time is calculated all over the prefrontal cortex. So as parts of the prefrontal cortex start to shut down, we can no longer separate past from present from future. And we're plunged into kind of this deep now, this hyper present. Also, in, in transient hypofrontality, this is an efficiency exchange. As focus, as energy is needed for focus and attention, right, other parts of the brain are deactivated to conserve energy. 
one of the parts of the brain that deactivates when this happens is the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. That's your inner critic. That's that kind of nagging defeatist voice that's always there, your inner Woody Allen. One of the reasons self disappears and lower in sense of self-consciousness because this part of the brain is shutting off. So we experience this as liberation. We are literally actually getting out of our own way. Flow state, this is all transient hypofrontality. As is this state, stuff... Sorry, Stephen. Is this stuff that people can experience or may ha- maybe have experienced when they're in deep meditation as well? It, forget meditation. If you've ever lost an afternoon to a great conversation, right? Mm. Sit down and you start talking to your friend and suddenly five hours go by and you have no idea where it is. That's time dilation, right? Mm. That's happening because parts of your prefrontal cortex are shutting off. If you've ever gotten so sucked into a work project that all else is forgotten, your ego goes away, that's your dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex turning off, right? Mm. So we all experience this. One of the mistakes about flow is people don't realize that it's a spectrum experience. So there are, flow is defined by kind of seven characteristics. And you can have micro flow when a couple of these things show up. So you get focused attention or the merger of action and awareness. Or you can have macro flow, which is when you get all of them, including time dilation, vanishing of self. And sometimes at the far end of the flow state, you get what, you know, what is termed cosmic unity, this becoming one with everything. Now, why does that happen? Because if you're paying massively focused attention, it moves, the, this, this transient hypofrontality moves from the prefrontal cortex deeper into the brain and it will go to the right temporal lobe. The right temporal lobe is a really unique part of the brain that helps us navigate through spaces. So it's the part of the brain that helps you differentiate kind of self from other, where you are and where other objects are. So people who have brain damage or a stroke to this area, they can't sit down on a couch because they don't quite know where their leg ends and the couch mm-hmm. begins, right? This is the part of the brain that is charged with separating the very finite you from the very infinite everything else. In wow. deep flow states and deep meditative states, whenever attention is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly focused, this part of the brain shuts down. So you can no longer distinguish self from other. Okay, so it it, wow. it, gets a, it gets a little stranger because not only can you not distinguish self from other, but whatever you tend to be attention to, where your focus is, you tend to merge with. So surfers, when they're in a tube and they're paying mass amounts of attention to the wave, they become one with the wave. Buddhist monks, when they're meditating on God's infinite nothingness, they become one with the universe. Dean Potter on the bottom of the cell of the flowers, picked up the dying bird. He was deep in flow. His attention system was massively high, and he paid all his attention to the bird, and he could no longer differentiate self from other, right? So he really did become one with the bird. Now, you talked about when I died, a part of me died. When the bird died, I died with that bird. So why does that happen? Not only did Dean feel literally like his sense of self, he had merged with the bird in flow, Five of the most potent neurochemicals the brain can produce are dumped into our system all at once. A lot of these neurochemicals serve very, very, very profound, fundamental bonding functions. So, for example, we get norepinephrine and dopamine. When these chemicals show up, we experience this as romantic love. When you fell in love with your wife or your girlfriend or your boyfriend... That's dopamine and norepinephrine providing that feeling. We get anandamide, which kind of provides an openness and expansiveness to experience we're more open to others. We get endorphins. These are the brain's natural opiates, right? They're natural versions of morphine and heroin, and they're very potent painkillers in the body. So one of the reasons Dean could do this, he wasn't in as much pain as other, because he had painkillers in the system, basically, from the endorphins. These endorphins also underpin social bonding. So in children, when a mother bonds to an infant, that's endorphins at work. In adults, when we make very close friendships, that's endorphins at work. So all of these very fundamental chemicals that drive empathy were present in, in Dean's system at the same time. So he really did feel like he was that bird. And when the bird died, a part of him was so hyper-connected because of what you know goes on in the brain and the body during flow that he really did feel like a part of him died with him. And you have to understand one final thing. 
we there are differences between mystical experiences and flow. There are certain mystical experiences that are totally different than, than flow. But as a general rule, what goes on in the brain when people have quote-unquote mystical experiences and what goes on in the brain during really deep flow experiences is a massive amount of overlap, which is why when William James was first looking at flow states back at the turn of the 19th century, right, some of the earliest work done on flow was done by William James, he thought he was looking at spiritual experiences. He was wrong. He, it was a, he was actually looking and studying religion to that point and finding the, their great commonality no matter what religion he was studying he found mystical experiences all shared a lot of common characteristics and he was also experimenting with hallucinogenic drugs and he found that those states also shared and there's a reason for that because the same thing is going on in the brain during a lot of these experiences which is to say we find with the our experiences of these states is deeply 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 profound Right, they they alter us fundamentally. We've known this since James with Maslow wrote about it. She's sent me high has written about it. A lot of people have worked on this. We are fundamentally different on the other side of these experiences. Yeah, and it sticks, which is what's what's incredible. So there's a reason these experiences stick with us, right? We've been talking a little bit about neurochemistry. Neurochemicals do a lot of things, right? They have that performance in flow. The five neurochemicals that show up do a lot of things. One of the things they do all neurochemicals essentially is they tag experiences. They're big neon signs that say important to save for later. Mm -hmm. So a good shorthand for learning and memory is the more neurochemicals that show up during an experience, the better chance that experience is going to be saved for later. Flow is a huge dump of neurochemicals, which is why, for example, in studies run by the U.S. military, they found snipers in flow learn 200 to 500% faster than normal, which suggests that flow can take those 10,000 hours for mastery and cut them in half, right? That's enhanced learning. We remember these things. There's a lot of, a lot of things go on in the brain during that, so we save it for later. We tag it as important. And truthfully, it, 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 it is important, right? These are, these are breakthrough fundamental experiences that shape us as people. They are very important. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question, like as a complete side tangent, but you said it, and it, as you're sharing uh, what's happening in the brain and, and Dean when he was down there, um, psychedelic drugs. So this guy you were saying was uh, James also studied hallucinogenics, but um, everyone talks about, you know, like you're opening your third eye, you're opening your third eye, and then I'm thinking as you're telling the story, and literally what it's sounding like is, that we're shutting down all these different parts of our brain, which yeah. allow us to see certain things in a way that we've never seen them. Is that a similar thing that's actually happening when people take psychedelics? Is that why they feel so connected? So there's a lot of different things going on in psychedelics, but uh, altered every altered state of consciousness is caused by transient hypofrontality. Part of the prefrontal cortex are shutting down. So Huxley, all the Huxley, right? Doors of perception, you've got to fling them wide open. That's where that third eye nonsense came from, right? Mm -hmm. you fling open. No, turns out Huxley had it exactly backwards. We're actually shutting down. We're narrowing perception. The doors of perception are closing. They're not opening. Now, various, now, psychedelics do a lot of other things, right? There's, we hallucinate in standard patterns. That's kind of what happens when you start messing with the optical system in various ways and shutting it down certain mm. things, right? If you, for example, you have edge recognition software, basically, in your, in your, in your eyes, in your brain, right? That one of the first things the brain, the eye, there's a bunch of different levels of, of visual processing at very low levels. It's really simple patterns. It's where's a line. It's edge recognition, things like that. If you start to shut down the part of the brain that's recognition and things start to blur together, you get that swirling effect that's, you know, infamous to anybody who's ever looked at psychedelic art or done psychedelics, right? Yep. That's because, right, so there are, scientists know this, there are actually categories of hallucinations. That's, some of it's neurochemically triggered, some of it's transient hypofrontality, but all these experiences are of a kind, they're of a type, various things. When people experience glossolalia, speaking in tongues, it's the part of the brain that does language shutting down. Wow. Right? So wow. all, 
all of what the thing to remember there's biology underneath all of our spirituality and you can say this means there is a god or there is no god you, the argument works both ways as far as i can tell and i don't have a position um all i can tell you is that you know just like we're all fundamentally hardwired for flow states we're all fundamentally hardwired for mystical experience <laughs> and sometimes it sounds like we confuse them well they're they're often they're the exact same thing Right? Yeah, that's what it sounds like. There are, so let me give you an example um, of, of, of how, let's talk about meditation versus flow versus, right? What's sure. different about the two? This is, this is, this is interesting. So in flow, portion of the brain called uh, the medial prefrontal cortex, which is part of your brain that essentially generates your creative personality, it becomes hyperactive, right? This is why John Coltrane and Sonny Stitt, they get into flow state, they play sax solos, and it's flow, right? So every action follows one to the next. is almost unconscious, right? They're both unconscious. If the sax solos sound totally different. It feels automatic, but it's totally different, totally individual. Why? Because the medial prefrontal cortex is essentially creative self-expression, and it's on overdrive in flow. Um, because flow is an action state. You're doing something. You're expressing yourself in some way. So mm-hmm. In meditation... You want to be totally gone. You're focusing on your breath. You're trying to get rid of your entire personality, right? So that mm-hmm. part of the brain does not turn on. It, it shuts down. You don't need it in meditation. You need it in, in flow. Um, so there, you know, there are fundamental differences, but there are great overlaps as well. Now, I know from, from doing a lot of other studying that, you know, in order to master something, like different parts of the brain, when you're taking in information, for example, like if I'm reading something, um, that one level ingrained in the brain. When I'm writing something, that goes to a different part of the brain, and then when I'm doing that action, that goes into yet another part of the brain. So is there, because what I've noticed through reading the book, like the guys that are out there doing, you know, crazy aerial moves or climbing mountains or riding big waves, etc., they're locking in certain data, which is kind of where I want to transition this conversation, which is like the aha moment. Together, but then they have that ability to, in essence, recreate that. Like, so they do it once, and then it's almost like muscle memory comes into play, and they have that ability. So what actually happens that these guys, or, or for us, uh, you know, anybody, when we do certain things, like why is it that certain times things get impregnated, and it's ours, like we've mastered it, and other times... It's it just kind of like we, we keep struggling with that same move or that same thing that we're trying to master over and over again. Okay, so that wraps up part one of my interview with Stephen Cutler. Hope you've enjoyed it so far. Now in part two, we're going to go into some really interesting parts, which is he's about to answer the science behind the aha moments and what actually happens in our brain and physically to us when the aha moment actually occurs and how we can recreate them. We're also going to cover the Roger Bannister effect. And for those that don't know it, it literally is the game changer that can actually predict what your future will look like. We'll get into that. And we'll also talk about the future of flow, what's happening with kids today, forms of education, etc. So I'll see you on part two of my interview with Stephen Cutler.